Well, he's painted and decaled and ready to go, so it's time to get this M8 Grizzly Walker from Conflict 47 weathered. <laughs> Now to start the process, I want to do some streaking, some rain streaks, weathering streaks, whatever you want to call them. I'm going to use these Vallejo model washes. I'm going to have dark yellow, European dust, and desert dust. And I've sent each one down with about 50-50 water. And then I'll just get a little on my brush, work off most of it. And uh, just using this liner brush, I just go in here and lightly streak it on like that going for very fine streaks. If you make a streak that's a little bigger than you want, just quickly get some water and clean it up. Now this will go on more opaque than it will dry, so you'll have to build up a lot of layers. But I just go around and just continually, randomly apply this. And it'll dry, and I'll go back and I'll switch colors and I'll change, uh, r rather I'll uh, apply it again, same color, there are different colors over it. And just keep doing this until you build it up, until you get the streaked appearance you're looking for. All right, you can see how that looks after six or seven applications of the model wash. As I go along, I progressively um, make it a little heavier down towards the bottom than at the top, just so that it looks like it collects there a little bit. And this can be as, again, as subtle or as in your face as you want. Um, if it's a little too subtle for you, then don't dilute the model wash with water. Um, if it's a little too in your face, add a little more water to it. Now on the upper surfaces, I like to use a sponge to apply the washes like this. And I just go across it. And put a little bit of the color on in random patterns and just build that up. Now these I'm very careful about drying them between applications so that there's a little bit of distinctiveness. On the streaking on the sides I'm okay if it um, if it blends in a little, it adds to it. I find that using the sponge application because you have a little less control over over the whole process um, I like to dry it between colors so that they kind of layer up on top of each other. All right, I'm ready to apply a wash, and I'm going to use some acrylic washes. I could use oils. I could use enamels. Um, the, the primary reason I like using acrylic is because it dries really fast. Um, really fast being I can get this on here, and by the time I get you know, if I start in one section and work my way around, by the time I get back here, this is dry and I can start putting stuff over it. So it's really fast, but I could use enamels here. I could use oils for the sake of speed, um, mainly to just get these videos done. I'm going to stick to acrylics. Now, you do have to be aware that when you're using acrylic washes, there can be tide marks. So what I like to do to uh, alleviate this is... I'll make a thinner mix of it and then just kind of apply it all around and then wick up excess and know that the extra that I put on there is going to tint the surface a little bit. That's okay. I'm all right with that. And it'll leave a nice um, wash around the bolt details and in the recess details and things like that. Now what I'm using is four parts Agrax Earthshade, two parts Known Oil, four parts Lamian medium, and then just a couple of drops of Liquitex flow aid to make sure uh, uh, that, it, that it flows around details nicely. Nothing magical about the mix. I just started putting stuff together, and this is the color that when it got to it, I thought, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. So nothing magical at all about it. But all I'm going to do is just really put this on here, just slop it on there like that and get it up into, make sure that it's into recesses and corners and around bolt detail and things like that. And then I'll just quickly clean off my brush and then just go in here and start wicking up any of the excess like that. That's going to leave some staining, 
but when it dries, it's going to be a lot less visible than it is now. This is uh, great for speed. If you're, if you're wanting more precise control, you're probably going to want to go to oils or enamels. Now there's ways to speed up the drying time of those. Um, one of my favorite ways is when I use oils is to use uh, a product from VMS called uh, Oil Expert, I think is what it's called. Yeah, Oil Expert. And what that does is it speeds up the drying time of oils. You actually use it kind of in place of the odorless thinner or along with the odorless thinner. And uh, it speeds up the drying time. But it's still you're still talking about a drying time of, you know, really to put things over it maybe overnight or something like that. You can see I gave that about 20 seconds with the hair dryer. There's still a few parts that are slightly damp, but um, it's dried up and I could, if I wanted to, just put something right over that. So it's very in a very efficient way to work. So let me get the rest of this done and uh, we'll move on. And for the chipping, I'm gonna use this Citadel Strachan Green or Strachan Green or Strachan Green Maybe it's Strachan Green. Anyway, I'm going to use that for the chipping. And I've got it here in my palette, and I've just thinned it down with a little bit of water, a um, touch of matte medium. Uh, so it's, it's fairly thin. It's probably one-to-one -one, uh, the thinners and the, and the paint. Uh, so it's, it's fairly thin. Now I'm going to use primarily a sponge for the chipping. Um, that'll get the bulk of it done. Now, if there's any areas that I have difficulty getting to and I want to simulate um, what I do with a sponge, I can use this, this chiseled uh, flat brush here. And I just use the edge of it and kind of the tip of it to kind of do the, a similar kind of pattern. It'll leave a pattern similar to the sponge, but just a little more precise. And then if there's any other areas where I want to refine it or I want to put in um, streaks or uh, scratches or anything like that. I'm going to use this uh, two zero liner brush for that. Now I have this theory and if you've watched some of my videos you've probably heard me mention this before but I have this theory born of experience that tells me the lower the contrast the light colored chipping the more you can get away with. It doesn't look as out of place as if you're using a high contrast, very high value color. So that's why I chose this color of green. It's got some gray in it. It's, it's lighter than this color, but it's not going to be shockingly uh, dissimilar like if I would have used this color that came with the modulation set. So uh, that's, that's one thing I do so that it, it helps reduce uh, the... The, how, how in your face, I guess you would say, the chipping is. So if you get a little more than you want on there, it's not going to look uh, too out of place. At the same time, I, I'm never one to say, oh, you overchipped that. Uh, if if, it, if you, the way you chip it is the way you like it, then that's the correct amount of chipping. Um, chipping is, is one of the fun parts of building a model. So if you enjoy chipping and you like adding a lot of chips, then add a lot of chips. And, um, you know, if somebody doesn't like it on social media, who cares? It's your model. Have fun with it. Now, because I'm imagining this thing walking through trees and, you know, stomping down buildings and things like that, I'm going to put a fair amount of chipping on, especially the forward facing edges and like up here on this shoulder armor, that's going to be where things fall on it. Um, you know, the crew walks on it, that kind of thing. I've always thought that every chip has a story. Chips don't happen in real life in a vacuum. Um, every chip that happens on anything, whether it's a military vehicle or just your car, is because something happened. And so as I'm doing the chipping, now I don't try and come up with a story for every single chip, but I look at the areas that I'm chipping and say, what would be the story of that place? 
you know. So, for example, these hatches are going to have more chipping on them from the crew opening and closing them and walking on them and, you know, banging them open and closed and that kind of thing. So that's going to get chipping. This is going to get chipping from, you know, running into things. It's walking through a forest. It's the trees are scraping away. The limbs are scraping away at the, the paint. Um, that's going to have some chipping on it. Certainly if there's uh, shells going off, um, artillery, things like that, there's going to be fragments all in the air. Uh, so those are going to make chips. So I just try to think when I'm doing my chipping, what is likely to happen with chips on this vehicle. And then I just try to replicate that. You can see here as the paint dries, right over here, it's kind of low contrast. So it allows uh, us to put more chips on without it being too, uh, too glaring and in your face. And uh, I think it just adds to the distressed look. And when I do these scratches along the surface, I just let the natural shake of my hand just kind of bounce along there. You can draw in a scratch, a very direct scratch. I mean, you could be very precise about it like that. But I like to hold the brush a little further back and take advantage of my old shaky hands and just let that kind of bounce along. I think it tends to look a little more natural. Now, the streaks, this type of chipping would probably be fore to aft because of limbs and things like that. Pieces of building and stuff like that. But don't, don't ignore maybe putting a vertical one here or there. Something could drop down, scrape along. And this is where you can really think about the story element of a scratch. You know, I imagine like that vertical scratch in my mind, that's from debris from a falling building. I mean, that's that's what I'm thinking in my mind. Now, you know, you look at a scratch on a model and you don't know if that would have been from a tree or from something in a building or a crewman dropping a wrench down the side. But it's with this kind of chipping that you can really get into thinking, what caused this? What is the story of that chip? And it just, in my opinion, it just adds to the fun. It may not change the way the chip looks, but it's just a fun part of the process. And you know me, I'm all about having fun. Now I want to add some darker chips, so I'm going to use my Vallejo German C Black Brown. And uh, really all, all I look for in this is just a darker brownish color, maybe with a hint of red to it. And it's just going to represent chips that go down to the underlying surface material. And it makes the assumption that that underlying surface material is some kind of ferrous material, which means it's made from ferrets. I just made that up. Um, that means it's going to be something that can rust. Now, even if you don't develop further rust tones after that, it's just going to, um, you know, give it a hint of weight, of realism, of thinking, of looking like, okay, this is some kind of metal. This is something heavy. And, uh, and if you do want to develop some rust stains from there, well, you've set a basis for it. Now, if you were imagining the underlying material to be some sort of composite, a darker gray might be better. Or some material that's not ferrous, um, a darker gray might work well. But I don't fill in all of the little green streaks, but I fill in a lot of them. The main place I want to focus on is like along any edges here, exposed edges. Those are going to get more chips and uh, going to be more worn down. And then any streaks like that, 
I may put some in there. And you can go heavier, you can go lighter. Um, if you want to add a, a streak that's just from the dark color, like that, you know, imagining something that hit that and caused a, a scrape that goes right down to the underlying material, you can add those in, just adds visual interest. But again, it's, it's what you think is right for your model. You're telling the story of this vehicle. Doesn't matter whether it's real, made up, um, what if, it doesn't matter. You're telling the story. You get to decide what this vehicle went through, why it went through it. And nobody can tell you that, well, it wouldn't have done that. Because you can always say, well, on that day, in my mind, it did. So I'm just continuing around doing this chipping, taking advantage of my shaky hand to get all of these dark chips in. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to add some of this Vallejo thick mud. It's European mud on here. Now it's a good product. I like using it, but it can be anything that's just muddy and textury. And you can see that it's just a thick textury paste. It's got uh, not only a muddy color, but it's got just chunks of, I don't even know what that is, just something. What I'm going to do is I'm going to apply this right along the feet quite heavily. And if it gets up onto the mechanical parts and all that, that's okay because this thing is walking through the mud. So the mud is going to get up on it. It's going to collect on it. It's going to leave, you know, as you would expect, a muddy texture on it. Now, how much is completely up to you. Uh, it just depends on the effect you're going for. But what I like to do is put this on, work it around some like that, and then clean off most of it off of my brush, get some water on my brush, and then just come in here and kind of blend it in like that. Um, it's going to spread it out a little. It's going to reduce it just a little. I want it to look muddy, but I don't want it to look like it's just covering up all the work that I've done. Now I do want it to look a little wet and a little contrasty to the rest of the background. This product will dry to a somewhat glossy finish. So it's going to look like wet mud, which is exactly what I want. Now I can go back and add some as I want to, just to see how it's going to look, going for whatever I think is the look I want. And you can place it in areas you know, where you think it might collect higher up on the leg, put a few patches of it here and there. And it's just a matter of working it with the water and the, the product that you're using. And the product you're using may not be water-based. It may be enamel, something like that. Um, it might be pigments, something you make yourself from pigments. But the idea here is just to get it blended in until it's the level of mud texture that you want for whatever it is you're trying to to achieve on it. Next I want to add just a few rust stains around maybe a few of the bolts coming off of maybe the hinges on one of these hatches maybe just a little bit on some of the the darker chipping. Now in reality would an armored vehicle like this that's probably going to be, I mean if this were real if this were going to be uh, in, in combat, you know, given that combat vehicles don't always last very long, they're either replaced because they're damaged or they're replaced because new models come out, would it rust? Probably not. But I like adding rust because I think it just looks cool. I also want to use this uh, Scrag Brown from Citadel. Now, I'm not using this because I don't have other rust colors. I've got plenty of other rust colors. But I wanted to use this because I've had quite a few people that have contacted me and said, what, what is the best rust set to get? Now, if you're looking to get a rust set, I would say get the Life Color Rust set. It's my favorite. But what I really feel like is the simplest answer is whatever color you think looks like rust. And this is one. It's, I don't know what a scrag is, but apparently they're brown <laughs> and they're this color. But this is a beautiful desaturated rust color. Now you can see that I've thinned it down with quite a bit of water so that it's really more of a wash consistency. 
and I just come in and I'll place this around a few bolts like that until I get just a little bit of a ring around it. Now when you're placing this on, if it gets to be a little too much, then just wick it up with your brush. Don't, don't worry that, you know, oh, that's too much. Like here, let me just deliberately put some on. If I get a big old blob of it like that, now it's going to dry much more transparent than it goes on, but if I get a big blob like that, I can just dry my brush off a little bit, come in here, wick it up, and there we go. In fact, that's not a bad application technique to put on a lot and then kind of dial it back with wicking up a little extra. So I'll just put this on in a few places and uh, don't have to be every bolt, but just enough to, to sell the notion that this thing has seen some use. Maybe it's been around a little bit and uh, it's been out in the, the field and you can add you know, you could add a rust streak like this and just build that up. Or you could do a little glaze over some damaged areas like this to indicate that maybe they're a little older damage, just like that. It's whatever you think. But like I said, it doesn't necessarily need to be a color designed specifically for rust because really all of those paints that you get from a manufacturer that are specifically labeled as rust sets they're just various shades of browns and oranges and stuff like that. So anything that you think looks like rust will work just fine. Now I'm going to use this Vallejo Fuel Stains product uh, to add some, not only fuel stains, but just liquid stains in general. Now here again, the product is not the important part. What I'm looking for here is something that's a slightly different brown than the earth effect colors that I've used. And I'm also using this one because it will dry glossy. Now, what that does is it indicates a fresher, more wet fuel stain. And it's going to provide some contrast between it and the rest of what's around it. That's really what I'm looking for, is I'm looking for something that's going to show that there is a stain there and that it's not dirt, it's not mud, but something else. Now, certainly you could combine this with other stain products uh, of a similar color. Uh, I often will use a matte color underneath to indicate older stains and things like that, and then put in some of this glossy product to indicate something that's a little fresher, a little newer. But you can use this brown to indicate fuel stains. You can use a darker something closer to black to indicate oil stains. Um, you may use something that's more red that can look kind of dieselish or like some other fuel. It's whatever you think uh, looks good. This is also good to put around the joints on the legs or the arms. It can indicate some kind of lubricant. Uh, so there's a lot of choices of what you've got to use on the market. And this is just that I'm talking about as acrylics. Of course, there are plenty of enamel and oil products that you can use and you can blend and you can do lots of things with. All right, I think for the purposes of video, I'm going to call this done. I still need to paint in the headlights here and I may look at it in a day or two and add a little more weathering, but it won't be anything that I haven't already done. Just be more application of the same. There's a machine gun that goes on top and it's made of what is euphemistically called white metal, but it's really just soft pewter and uh, broke off the mounting pin so I'm gonna have to do a little minor surgery on that I'll just drill that out and uh, uh, put another pin in there and then I can mount it up there and I'll just dry brush this and give it a little bit of painting so there won't be anything special with what I'm gonna do but uh, when you see it in the uh, the final the final photos and uh, and the thumbnail that's that's why that suddenly appeared out of nowhere because I've still got to try and fix this. In fact, the barrel is slightly bent and it seems like no matter how I bend it, it still looks bent. So <laughs> if it doesn't show up after this in the photos, you'll know I got frustrated and just left it off. <laughs> now, this is a super fun kit. It really looks cool. It's a lot of fun to paint and weather. The assembly's not too difficult. It's just a few parts. Yeah, it's resin and metal, but it all goes together well. And once it's together and primed, it just builds like any other model. 
It's unique looking. It's fun. And though it's for a game, even if you're not a gamer, I think looking at the models that are part of the tabletop gaming world, you might find some stuff there that's very interesting, very unique. You're not going to find it anywhere else and uh, is a lot of fun to build. So be sure and check that out. Well, thank you so much for uh, watching this video, especially if you're still watching at this point. In fact, if you're still watching at this point, why not drop a comment down below that just says something like uh, Little Green Stompy. Um, that way I'll know that you watched all the way to the very end and anybody else who sees that will wonder, what are you guys talking about? But we'll know what it is and we'll have a good laugh at it. But thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. And there's links down below to the social media, to my blog, to Patreon. There's a link over here to subscribe. Please subscribe and hit the like button. That'll help uh, help me grow the channel. And uh, hit that little bell icon too so you'll know when I have new videos out. And if you're already supporting me on Patreon, thank you so much. It is a blessing to me. It's a blessing to my family. And uh, I just couldn't do it at the pace that I do it with the materials and the kits and everything else that I do uh, if it weren't for you. Uh, we just couldn't afford it. So uh, it, it not only helps me, like I said, it helps my family. I can bring this content to you and uh, can afford to do it. So thank you very much, Patreon supporters. And with all that being said, I'll leave you with one final thought, as I always like to do. In this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.